In 1972, Carl Sagan and George Mullen ran the numbers on stellar evolution and reached an uncomfortable conclusion. Four billion years ago, the sun burned at only 70% of its current brightness. Under that dim star, Earth's surface should have frozen at minus 10 degrees Celsius, cold enough to lock the entire planet in ice. Once that ice formed, its white surface would have reflected what little sunlight remained back into space, triggering a runaway cooling that no force could remove. Universe. The weak young sun lacked the power to melt a frozen Earth. It should have stayed frozen forever. But the rocks tell a different story. Ancient minerals, volcanic structures, and ocean sediments all confirm that Earth was warm, wet, and teeming with microbial life during the very period it should have been a lifeless ice ball. This is the faint young sun paradox, and solving it requires rethinking what makes a planet habitable. The paradox begins with stellar physics. Our sun is a main sequence star, fusing hydrogen into helium in its core. As the fusion reactions proceed, helium ash accumulates at the center. This helium is denser than hydrogen, so the core compresses under its own weight. A denser core requires higher temperatures and pressures to maintain equilibrium against gravitational collapse. Those higher temperatures make the fusion reactions run hotter and faster, which increases the sun's total energy output. This is not speculation. It is observable in thousands of similar stars across the galaxy. Stars predictably brighten as they age, gaining about 10% luminosity per billion years. Four billion years ago, during the early Archean Eon, the sun's luminosity sat at 70 to 75% of today's output. That translates to roughly 950 watts per square meter reaching Earth's surface, compared to 1361 watts today. The difference is not trivial. If you placed Earth's current atmosphere under a 70% luminosity sun, global average temperatures would plunge to minus 10 degrees Celsius or lower. The freezing point of water is zero degrees. Under those conditions, ice would form at the poles then spread. Ice reflects 80 to 90% of incoming sunlight, a property called albedo. More ice means more reflection, which means colder temperatures, which means more ice. This feedback loop, once triggered, becomes self-reinforcing. The planet spirals into a permanent frozen state called Snowball Earth. The geological record says this did not happen. Not only did Earth avoid freezing, it was warm enough to sustain liquid oceans, and, by at least 3.8 billion years ago, life itself. The physics of the sun and the chemistry of the rocks cannot both be correct unless something about early Earth's climate system was fundamentally different from what we see today. That missing variable is the paradox. The proof of ancient liquid water comes from four independent lines of evidence, each pointing to the same conclusion. The oldest evidence sits in the Jack Hills of Western Australia. Zircons, microscopic crystals of zirconium silicate, found in those hills have been dated to 4.4 billion years ago, just 150 million years after Earth's formation. Zircons are nearly indestructible, surviving eons of heat, pressure, and erosion. When they crystallize from molten magma, they lock oxygen atoms into their mineral structure. Scientists can measure the ratio of two oxygen isotopes, oxygen-18 and oxygen-16, preserved in those crystals. The specific ratio found in Jack Hill's zircons matches the fingerprint of magma that interacted with liquid water. This is the earliest signal we have that oceans existed almost immediately after the planet cooled. The second clue comes from Greenland. The Izua Greenstone Belt preserves some of the oldest intact rocks on Earth, dated to 3.7 to 3.8 billion years ago. Within this formation lie clear sedimentary rocks, layers of compressed mud, sand, and silt. Sedimentary deposits require a standing body of liquid water to form. Particles settle out of suspension, accumulate on a lake bed or seafloor, and compact over millions of years into stone. You cannot make sedimentary rock without liquid water to carry and deposit the sediment. The third line of evidence is even more direct. Also found in the Izwa belt are structures called pillow lavas. These are bulbous, pillow-shaped formations that lava creates only when it erupts underwater. When molten rock meets cold water, the outer surface quenches instantly, forming a crust. Pressure from the continuing eruption cracks that crust open, and more lava oozes out to form another pillow. The process repeats, 
stacking pillows into recognizable formations. Finding 3.8 billion year old pillow lavas is unambiguous proof of deep liquid oceans. The fourth clue spans a much longer time scale. Banded iron formations, or BIFS, are layered sedimentary rocks with alternating bands of iron rich minerals and silica. They appear in the geological record from 3.8 billion years ago to about 1.8 billion years ago. Their formation requires liquid oceans saturated with dissolved iron, which precipitates out when oxygen levels fluctuate. We will return to what caused those oxygen fluctuations, but the existence of BIFS across a billion years confirms that Earth's oceans remained liquid for an immense stretch of time under a sun that should have frozen them solid. Understanding how Earth stayed warm requires reconstructing what the planet actually looked like. The early Archean was not a younger version of the modern world. It was an alien environment with atmospheric, oceanic, and astronomical conditions that no longer exist. The atmosphere contained almost no free oxygen. Instead, it was dominated by nitrogen, carbon dioxide, water vapor, and significant amounts of methane and ammonia. Hydrogen sulfide and other sulfur compounds would have been common near volcanic regions. The high methane concentration may have created an organic haze similar to the smog that blankets Saturn's moon titan today. This haze would have scattered blue light, painting the sky a pale orange or brownish pink instead of the familiar blue we see now. The oceans were not blue either. With no free oxygen in the atmosphere, iron weathered from volcanic rocks and continental crust dissolved into seawater instead of oxidizing and settling out. The oceans accumulated massive concentrations of dissolved ferrous iron, giving the water an olive green or muddy brown color. Any oxygen that did appear from chemical reactions or early microbial metabolism was immediately consumed by this iron, which is why atmospheric oxygen remained near zero for over a billion years. The Earth's rotation was much faster. Tidal interactions with the moon have been gradually slowing Earth's spin over geologic time. Four billion years ago, a single day lasted only six to 10 hours. The moon itself orbited much closer, perhaps as near as 15,000 miles, compared to today's 239,000 miles. At that distance, the moon's gravitational pull was exponentially stronger. This generated colossal tides, possibly hundreds of feet high, sweeping across the planet twice per day. These supertides mixed the oceans violently and dissipated enormous amounts of energy as frictional heat, warming the water and the crust. The the planet's internal heat engine was also far more active. Radioactive decay in the core produced more geothermal energy than it does today. Volcanism was constant and extreme. Magma resurfaced the planet regularly, and volcanic eruptions pumped massive volumes of greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, water vapor, into the atmosphere. This was not occasional activity. It was a planetary scale furnace operating continuously. Continental crust was minimal. There were no large land masses like modern continents. Instead, small volcanic islands and microcontinents of dark basaltic rock dotted a global ocean. This had a critical consequence for climate. Dark surfaces absorb sunlight efficiently, while bright surfaces reflect it. Ice and sand have high albedo. They reflect 70 to 90% of incoming light. Dark basalt and deep ocean water have low albedo. They absorb 70 to 80%. A planet covered in dark rock and water captures every photon of weak sunlight it can get. This alone would not solve the paradox, but it helps. Solving the faint young sun. Paradox requires finding a mechanism that could trap enough heat to compensate for the 30% solar deficit. The leading candidates are greenhouse gases, but not all all gases are equal, and each hypothesis has complications. Carbon dioxide is the most straightforward candidate. Volcanic outgassing would have maintained high CO2 levels in the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide absorbs infrared radiation emitted by Earth's surface, trapping heat that would otherwise escape to space. The question is whether CO2 alone could have been enough. 
early models suggested that atmospheric CO2 concentrations would need to reach extreme levels, perhaps 100 to 1,000 times higher than today, to compensate for the dim sun. At those concentrations, CO2 begins to condense into clouds, which reflects sunlight rather than trapping heat. This creates a ceiling on how much warming CO2 can provide. Recent models suggest volcanic outgassing could have sustained CO2 at high but subcondensation levels, making it a strong contributor, but probably not the sole solution. Methane is 25 times more effective as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide, but it poses a different problem. Ultraviolet radiation from the sun breaks down methane molecules relatively quickly, within a few thousand years. To maintain high atmospheric methane levels, you need a constant source pumping fresh methane into the air. Geological sources like volcanic vents can release some methane, but probably not enough to sustain the concentrations required. Biological sources, however, are another matter. Ammonia was proposed early on as a possible solution because it absorbs infrared radiation very efficiently. However, ammonia is extremely vulnerable to destruction by ultraviolet light. Without an ozone layer to shield the atmosphere, UV radiation would have photolyzed ammonia within decades. Unless volcanic outgassing could replace ammonia faster than UV destroyed it, ammonia likely played only a minor and transient role. A different class of solution involves heat sources that do not depend on the sun at all. The Earth's interior was hotter, generating more geothermal warmth from radioactive decay of uranium, thorium, and potassium in the mantle and crust. The close moon generated tidal friction, dissipating gravitational energy as heat in the oceans and lithosphere. Together, these bottom-up heat sources may have provided a baseline warmth that kept the deep oceans from freezing, even if the surface cooled. This would have prevented the ice albedo feedback from ever fully taking hold. The most likely answer is not a single mechanism, but a combination. Volcanic carbon dioxide provided steady greenhouse warming. Methane, supplied by both geological and biological sources, amplified that effect. Tidal and geothermal heat added a baseline warmth that kept the oceans liquid, and the dark low albedo surface ensured that whatever weak sunlight reached Earth was absorbed, not reflected. Together, these factors compensated for the sun's 30% luminosity deficit. Life did not simply appear on a warm planet. It may have been the mechanism that created and maintained those warm conditions. The surface of the Archean Earth was hostile. Without an ozone layer, ultraviolet radiation from even the faint sun would have been intense enough to sterilize exposed surfaces. Life almost certainly began in the deep ocean, shielded from UV by thousands of feet of water. The most likely birthplace Place is hydrothermal vents, fissures on the seafloor, where superheated mineral-rich water from Earth's crust gushes into the cold ocean. These vents provided everything early life needed. The fluid was rich in hydrogen and carbon dioxide. The temperature gradient between hot vent fluid and cold seawater created a natural energy source. The earliest organisms were chemosynthetic. They extracted energy from chemical reactions rather than sunlight. They consumed hydrogen and carbon dioxide oxide and released methane as waste. These were methanogens, a group of archaea that still exist today in extreme environments like deep sea vents, volcanic hot springs, and the guts of animals. Methanogens may have been the critical piece of the climate puzzle. They took carbon dioxide, a greenhouse gas, and converted it into methane, a far more powerful greenhouse gas. If methanogen populations were large enough and widespread enough across the ocean floor, they could have maintained high atmosphere atmospheric methane levels despite UV destruction. This would have created a feedback loop. Methane warmed the planet. A warm planet provided more habitable environments for methanogens. More methanogens produced more methane. This is life engineering its own survival. Around 3.5 billion years ago, a different group of microbes evolved a revolutionary metabolism. Cyanobacteria developed oxygenic photosynthesis using sunlight to split water molecules and release oxygen as waste. This was an enormous leap. Photosynthesis gave life access to an essentially infinite energy source, the sun and an infinite raw material, water. Cyanobacteria formed dense mats on the seafloor and in shallow coastal zones. These mats captured sediment and grew upward toward the light, layer by layer, 
over thousands of years. The result was stromatolites, large, layered, dome-shaped fossils. Finding 3.5 billion-year-old stromatolites is direct proof of complex photosynthetic communities. The oxygen that cyanobacteria released did not accumulate in the atmosphere. It immediately reacted with the dissolved iron in the oceans, oxidizing it into ferric iron, which precipitated out and settled on the seafloor. Over millions of years, this process created alternating layers of iron-rich minerals and silica, the banded iron formations. This cycling continued for over a billion years, meaning cyanobacteria pumped oxygen into the oceans for more than a billion years before the iron was finally exhausted, and oxygen began accumulating in the atmosphere. The BIFS are not just evidence of liquid water, they are evidence of life operating at planetary scale, transforming ocean chemistry for an entire geological eon. The Faint Young Sun Paradox is not just an ancient mystery, it forces us to rethink how we search for life beyond Earth. Astronomers traditionally define a star's habitable zone as the orbital distance where a planet receives enough light to keep liquid water on its surface. This Goldilocks zone is calculated almost entirely from stellar luminosity. A planet orbiting a dim star must orbit closer to receive the same energy flux as Earth receives from the Sun. But the faint young Sun paradox proves this concept is too narrow. Earth itself was outside the conventionally defined habitable zone for its first billion years, yet it was not only habitable, it was inhabited. Habitability is not just a function of starlight. It is a negotiation between stellar energy, geological activity, atmospheric composition, and biosphere feedback. This has direct implications for exoplanet research. When astronomers use the James Webb Space Telescope to analyze exoplanet atmospheres, they look for biosignatures, chemical signals that suggest life. Oxygen is often discussed as the key biosignature, but Earth's own history shows that for the first two billion years of life, oxygen was not a useful indicator. Instead, the signature of a living planet was an atmosphere in chemical disequilibrium, specifically high levels of both methane and carbon dioxide coexisting. Without a constant biological source, methane would be destroyed by starlight within millennia. Finding methane and carbon dioxide together, especially in a planet's early history, would be strong evidence for microbial life like methanogens. The faint young sun paradox has given us a new fingerprint to search for. The paradox also offers hope for planets orbiting red dwarf stars. Red dwarfs are the most common stars in the galaxy, accounting for 70 to 80 percent of all stars. They are small, cool, and dim much like the young sun. Planets in their habitable zones orbit very close and receive weak light. For years, scientists were pessimistic about whether such planets could support life. But Earth's history is the proof of concept. A planet orbiting a dim star can remain warm and habitable for billions of years if it has active volcanism to supply greenhouse gases, geological heat sources like tidal friction, and microbial life to amplify greenhouse effects through metabolic waste. Red dwarf systems may not be dead zones, they may be teeming with life. The faint young sun paradox reveals that a planet's climate is not static. It is a living, self-regulating system. Life is not a passenger that appears when conditions are perfect. Life is an engineer that creates the conditions it needs to survive. Methanogens warmed a planet that should have frozen. Cyanobacteria rusted an ocean and laid the groundwork for an oxygen-rich atmosphere that would eventually allow complex life to evolve. The paradox is not just about how Earth stayed warm under a dim sun. It is about how life and planet co-evolved, each shaping the other, turning a cold, hostile rock into a world where survival was possible. The paradox remains partially unsolved. We still cannot say with certainty which greenhouse gas dominated, or exactly when methanogens reached population densities high enough to alter the climate, or how much of the warming came from tidal heat versus volcanic outgassing. What 
what we do know is that Earth survived conditions that should have killed it. The planet compensated for a weak sun through a combination of internal heat, atmospheric chemistry, surface properties, and microbial metabolism working together as an integrated system. That system was not designed. It emerged from the interaction of geology, chemistry, and biology, each responding to the others, creating feedback loops that stabilized temperatures within the narrow range where liquid water could persist. The fact that we exist to ask these questions is proof that the system worked. Whether it was luck, inevitability, or something in between, Earth turned a death sentence into 4 billion years of habitability. And if it happened here, under a star too dim to support life, it can happen elsewhere.